All right. We're about to have a little bit of fun tonight. I hope you enjoy this. But first of all, greetings from your imposter syndrome, even though you don't deserve to be here. How many of you wonder daily, rolling through your mind, whether or not you are waiting for the moment that somebody realizes that you aren't who you say you are? How often do you have that voice inside your head that reminds you, you're not good enough, over and over? Do you downplay your achievements, deflect any compliments that you get, or even defer the credit for your work to somebody else? That voice inside your head is strong. Despite that, what if you woke up tomorrow and all of that was gone. Your world were perfect. But how would you know it? Because you would no longer feel like an imposter. For over two decades, I have counseled people on their mental health concerns. I have seen people at their best. I've also seen people at their worst. I've seen people struggle with anxiety. I've seen people struggle with depression and even suicidal ideation. And over the years, it was important to me to recognize that how those people got there mattered. Because for me, it mattered. I understood what it was like to feel like an imposter. Tonight, what we're going to talk about is the imposter syndrome. We're going to talk a little bit about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how If Maslow were around during social media time, he might have changed what he thought about that theory. And then we're going to go a little bit further, and we're going to talk about how it is that we stop those thoughts. How do we break that cycle so that you don't have that negative feedback loop constantly rolling in your head? In 1978, I call it the year of the imposter because Dr. Pauline Rose Clance who was a clinical psychologist along with her partner, Dr. Susan Imes, coined the term the imposter phenomenon. Interestingly enough, today we call it a syndrome. But the thing is, it's not a syndrome. It is not a clinical diagnosis. But when left unchecked, it it can be. It can turn to anxiety. It can turn to depression. It can turn to suicidal ideation. These are things we must keep in check. When they very first did their research, interestingly enough, It was done during a time where women were struggling to own their place in a male-dominated world. So the preponderance of participants who felt this imposter syndrome were actually women. As time went on, research revealed that both men and women feel this. Interestingly enough, research done within the last few years shows that 82% of people have experienced imposter syndrome or are currently experiencing it. That's a pretty significant number of people. So over time, again, left unchecked, we take this phenomenon and we turn it into a syndrome. My dad. The part where I'm not supposed to cry. Greatest human being in the world. I was raised with a man who told me I was and could be whatever I wanted. He empowered me from the moment I was born until the day that man died and even to today. The empowerment that he provided me was for me to be self-empowered, not for me to obtain any empowerment from another person. He wanted me to recognize that the value of my worth was dictated by me. And to do that, it was critically important to him that I be educated. Because educated people make educated decisions. So in my life with my father, I had the experience of of getting to be able to fail, get up and succeed, fail again, and continue on. But the one thing I always knew was my worth. That was until I didn't. Senior year in high school, my guidance counselor calls me into her little closet size office I had no idea what she wanted. I thought for certain she was going to, who knows, give me guidance counselor information. And as I sat down, she said, oh, honey, what we're here to talk about today is your future and what I think you're capable of. I sat up in my chair, and I said, wonderful. 
I'm going to be a lawyer or maybe even a doctor. And I will never forget as long as I live that she looked at me dead in the eyes, clasped her chest, and laughed as hard as she could and said, no, no, baby. What you're going to be is not that intellectually advanced. I'm going to encourage you to go into cosmetology. Now, one of the things my father told me more than anything is that it was okay for me to be strong-willed. But I'm positive that the words that flew out of my mouth at that point in time was not what he meant by strong-willed. I had to deal with the wrath of Daddy when I got home. But what she taught me is that there were people out there who didn't believe in my worth. And what she did at that very moment, no matter what my father had told me, no matter the millions of times he told me how empowered I was, he told me to understand and know my worth. What she did was rob me at that very moment of what I felt was my worth. Because that was the first time in my life I placed my worth in someone else's hands. It took me a while to get over that. Many years. Contrary to her unpopular belief, I did get into college. And I went. But I had already had a self-fulfilling prophecy brewing in my mind. It was already there. I knew I would fail before I even started. So I went, and the first week, I didn't even hear one lecture. I came home. So you can imagine my father's significant unhappiness. Wasn't happy with that. And he said, you have two choices, young lady. Kind of like red socks, blue socks when you have kids. The choice was, I was going to wear socks. I just got to choose which color. I tried to use that with my children in parenting growing up. It didn't work as well. I had two choices. I could get a full-time job, or I could go to college. But what I wasn't going to do was sit around pitying myself. So I registered for community college right here with the unofficial transcript I'm showing you. And have you see the Fs and the withdraw? That was me. Because what would happen is every single night that it was time for me to go to class, or every day, I would pack up my book bag, lying to my father, and I would say, have a great day. And I would go somewhere, but it wasn't to class. I showed up a few times so they knew who I was. Didn't want to get in trouble. And then the last day, the last day for finals, I showed up. And this teacher said, who are you? And I knew at that moment that by the time my father found this out, I better have a really good story. But I didn't. I didn't. All I knew at that point was I better beat that report card home. But guess what? I didn't. I didn't beat that report card home. And when I came home, I had to find the wrath of my father. Not for being less, not for failing, but for lying to him. Because our relationship was built on trust, honesty, and respect. And because of these thoughts rolling around in my mind, telling me I was never going to be good enough, I let them win. And I let them rob me, not only of everything else, but my relationship with my father. It didn't take long before he wore me down. He told me I was going to go to college, and I did. I decided at that point, though, that when I went to college, he decided I had to pay for it on my own. I had to register on my own. I had to do it all on my own. That's a very different mindset than when somebody else is paying for it. So in me going to school, I had to figure out how to be successful. And I was very successful. I passed my classes. I did well. The teachers liked me. But every moment of success, I handed it to somebody else. Oh, it was because I was in your group. It was because you spent extra time answering my questions. It was never because I had worth. It was never because I had intelligence. It was because... Somebody else must have done it for me. I was lucky. But the reality was, at home, I was being raised by the pull-yourself-up-by-your-bootstraps kind of generational parent who, one, emphasized the importance of making sure I knew who I was, and the other one would let me know that I wasn't necessarily who I thought I might be. So I had the push-pull of the support and the criticism as most high-achieving achieving people do. So at some point, I didn't have a counselor to talk to. But I decided that this was going to be my path. 
I would help other people learn how to not fall into this trap of being the imposter. During my studies, I learned about this guy named Abraham Maslow, who was a psychologist from America. Abraham Maslow had this whole theory of psychological health and wellness. And what he said is in order for you to reach the self-actualization we talk about, in order to get there, you must first go through a series of stages. As each stage is gone through, you will have achieved the belongingness, the whatever it is that you needed at that stage so that your self-awareness, your self-understanding, your self-worth was driven by you, not another person. In the day, what he thought was, first, we had to worry about our food, our shelter, our things like that. That's, that was important. But then he also said, your safety and your love and belongingness, that will all come. Now, Maslow believed that these sections were fluid, and they were all contingent upon you having met the last stage in order to go forward. He didn't believe everybody reached this state of self-actualization. But what he did believe was that it was possible if you believed enough in yourself. Interesting. We're going to keep that in mind. So as I saw patients over the last 20 plus years, what I saw over and over and over were the number of people who weren't going through Maslow's stages. What they were going through was these periods of thinking they were doing well and failing and thinking they were doing well and looking to other people. And I thought, I've got to figure out this puzzle. And the one role that I have in my entire life that I know without a, any hesitation is chief puzzle maker. I'm sure my students are laughing. I see, I see the students laughing. And the reason is it's known as a Dr. Carla-ism because I constantly talk about being a chief puzzle maker. I look for the pieces that are missing to figure out how to help other people get to the point that they need to be. With that being said, I set out to figure out what is so different why is it so different today than it was all those years ago? Mm, yeah, social media. Social media gives us this belief that we have to seek out the importance of other people's opinions of us. You don't have to actually be self-actualized in social media all you have to do is have a perception that you've achieved a state of social or of a state of self-actualization. With that being said, it's important to understand what Maslow didn't know was that he was going to run up against social media. Where reaching those levels of self-actualization only happens if you got the best shot, if you did what you needed to do to get the likes and the followers. And that's very different than what we have today. Social media has taken a hold of our life in a way that we look to other people. But in searching through all these people, all these people with all these similar experiences, and I knew none of them met my guidance counselor. So I knew none of them had the same experiences that I did, and none of them were robbed by her. But with social media, we have to take a look at, if I were to take Maslow's hierarchy of needs today, would it change? Mm. It would change only in that I would take it and I would flip it upside down and it would be, the point would be the precipice in the middle of my hand, teetering back and forth between making sure that people think we are self-actualized. How do they do that? Well, let's look at this. I have seen patients that will give up their rent, their food, their whatever to have money for bottle service just so that they can get a picture for the gram. All right, yeah. Yeah. Safety and security, they'll do wild things to get to the point that they actually can get that photo for other people to see it. But the problem with social media is that we log into other people's drama. We log into a place where no matter what, there's an instant comparison. There's no empowerment in comparison. The only per person you should compare yourself with is you. But yet social media brings us to a place that all of these things that used to be important are important, but in reverse. What's important is that others perceive that you've done that. What matters are the number of filters you can use, 
the number of selfies you can discard for that one great one, the number of posts that you edit. Everything about social media drives us to a place where we don't feel empowered. We will never feel self-actualized. That's if the people on your social media pages are your friends. Imagine if they're a troll. Imagine if it's somebody who doesn't agree with you. Imagine how the negative side of social media can suck you in and make you feel even less. It matters that social media has taken over our life. With that being said, everybody just gasped. What if I told you one of the ways to fix this was to stop being on social media? Notice how many people are clinging to their phone right now. I see you. I, I see you. Okay? Nobody wants to give up social media because there is an element of social media that makes people feel good about themselves. But it only makes them feel good about themselves for a matter of minutes. And then they go back to the spiral of, I'm not enough. So how do we fix that? So what? So we know these things. We know that Maslow wasn't here to recreate his theory. It has to be Dr. Carla's theory of Maslow's recreation. All right, I'll take credit for that in any academic journal. Okay, so it's not that. So what, this? That is never going to happen. Never in a million years are my kids going to say, absolutely, let me give you my phone. I don't need it anymore. Neither are any of my clients or patients. I certainly don't know what happened to those arrows, but let's figure this out anyway. What we do need to work on, though, is our second option. How do you break that negative feedback loop? That negative feedback loop is the thing that rolls around in your head that says the moment you think something, you either have to engage in a behavior or have a thought that makes you feel less. So the only way to stop these behaviors and thoughts is to stop it at the thought. Having those self-affirmations looking at the reality of the statements you believe in your head. It's so easy to think you're less without other people telling you you're less. But what if you woke up and what you said to yourself was, no, I'm actually more. You've got to take control of this. First, identify the triggers. What are the things that make you feel bad about yourself? If social media is it, then you need to consider whether or not it's rational for your life. If it's not, that's fine too. You have to separate your fears from facts. Just because somebody says something doesn't make it true. Also importantly, to document your accomplishments. Put post-it notes everywhere, all over the place to tell you. You're not just worth it, you're worth it because of why. All over. And lastly, ask yourself, am I really less? Because if you're not left, then you got mad skills, not just lucky.